Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Vicky. Today, I'm not going to show you the most amazing library in Python that's going to change your lives. And I'm not going to give you the algorithm that's going to make all your dreams come true. But what I am going to do is I'm going to show you how using the right technological tools with just the right amount of willpower can lead to changes in old industries. And I hope that by the end of my talk, I will have lit a few fires in the crowd. So my story begins about a year and a half ago. It was my first month as group lead. I was just getting to know my people and, and the office. I was having a coffee break, just deleting some emails, you know. <laughs> and one of my friends comes in, who's a project manager, and he's also an active sailor. And we get to talking, and he starts telling me about the last time he sailed. And at some point, he gets to ranting. He says that whenever he enters a ship, he's forced to listen to all the engines around him and say if something sounds a little bit off. And he sails a lot. So he's so used to listening to all the engines that he knows when something sounds a little bit off. And he was really annoyed, like super, super annoyed. And I was trying to be nice. And I said, oh, that sounds horrible. I wish there was an app that listens instead of you. And then we laughed for a moment because everybody builds apps now and there's an app for everything, for this and for that. But then we stopped laughing and we looked at each other and we said, wait, let's do an app that listens instead of you. So when it comes to software projects, I'm pretty sure I know my ground. I know how a project is supposed to begin. I know how it's supposed to end. I know the between unless my client decides to change the demands every other day. But this was a totally different kind of project because it involved things I never had anything to do with. Things like maintenance and engines and mechanics and whatnot. So I had to start researching. So I talked to a lot of friends who were mechanical engineers and I talked to Google a lot. And I began researching this whole field of maintenance. And I realized that today, in every, co in every big company that relies on big machines, they do at least two types of maintenance. The first type is preventive maintenance. For example, when I take my car to the shop, I know that every 20,000 the car adds, the 25,000 kilometers the car adds, I have to go, take it to the shop, and come back a few hours later, and get it in slightly better shape. So what they do is they clean the brakes a little bit to prevent anything faulty in the brakes. They touch the engine a little bit to prevent any faults in the engine. And they try to prevent whatever fault may occur in any of the mechanical pieces. But in two days time, I fly off to Budapest and I need my car to take me to the airport. What happens if on Thursday morning I go down the stairs to the parking lot and I find a very dead car battery? What am I going to do then? Then I'm going to have to find a fix for the fault. And that's the second type of maintenance that's being performed. It's breakdown maintenance. It's we couldn't prevent the fault from happening, and now we have to find a fix. Now, when it comes to cars, it's a little bit inconvenient, I know. We have to take the bus. Maybe we have to take two buses to work. Maybe we have to take the train, God forbid, and the trains, they get cancelled all the time. But when it comes to vessels, it's a little bit more difficult than that because vessels, they have to perform their missions. And when an engine breaks in one of the vessels, then it can perform its missions. And then other vessels may need to perform its missions for it. And what about spare parts? If spare parts are within the country, we're in good luck. But sometimes spare parts, we have to fly them over from a different country. And then we have to wait for the shipment to come in, and then it gets stuck in customs. And then when it's finally in Israel, Technicians, they have to move from their regular jobs and they have to go and try and find a fix right now and they can't perform their missions either. So it's one big mess. So preventive maintenance doesn't prevent all types of failures. We can't really say that come to the shop every 20,000 kilometers and everything will be fine. Breakdown maintenance is the worst case scenario. Isn't there anything we can do in between the two? Well, there is. There is this magical word Predictive maintenance. I'm sure everybody's heard of this word, but the, the, the meaning of predictive maintenance is we try to predict the fault before it happens. And the basis of this assumption is we need to know the engine itself as well as we, as well as we can, and that's how we predict the fault. Now, in, like many things that have happened in the past, many great things that have happened in the past, predictive maintenance also began at NASA somewhere in the beginning of the 90s, 
a bunch of mechanical engineers were sitting around the table yelling at each other, we're not doing maintenance well enough, we have to do it efficiently. And in order to test this theory, they took a hundred engines and they collected some data and they did some really simple equations. It was really the beginning of the beginning of predictive maintenance. And they found out that out of the 100 engines that were supposed to go into a preventive maintenance routine, only four actually needed. And then they began their massive research on predictive maintenance, and they're like top of the world right now. So how is it done? Basically, in the past, in the past couple of decades, it was done um, based on a physical model. A physical model means we have to know the engines as well as we can. We have to know how they move, how they sound, how the oil is supposed to be. We have to know everything there is to know about the engine. Now, how do you know everything there is to know about the engine? There are a lot of methods. You can do it via vibration analysis, where your features are um, a velocity and acceleration, or oil analysis, where your features are um, uh, the health of the oil or the contamination of the oil and stuff like that. Acoustic analysis of frequency is the feature, and many more. So for our project, we began going in this direction. We said, okay, let's try doing, doing it with the physical model and see what we can get. So we started, we started researching the vibration analysis, and vibration analysis this is something we really like because it sounds amazing. It allows the user to evaluate the condition of equipment and avoid failures. Sounds amazing, right? And then we said, okay, it sounds great. They do their, their work behind the scenes. And then they have a really friendly UI because they know the client has to be happy. And I can actually see the picture of the engine and a lot of uh, green and red dots saying, um, this part is good, this part is faulty. But there's one big problem with this, with this method, and it's we need a mechanical engineer with us every step of the way. And a vibration analyst is an actual profession. This is something I didn't know. <laughs> it's something you have to learn, and you have to be super experienced in order to make, uh, to make the model as accurate as we need it to be. So it's not like I can open a YouTube tutorial and <laughs> see, hey guys, in the next four minutes I'm going to show you how to become a vibration analyst. It doesn't work that way unfortunately. So we had to move on and research another method. The second method we, we researched was really what was done at NASA. We said, okay, NASA know what they're doing. Let's, let's see what they're doing. So they took um, slightly different features. They took current and voltage. And they did the whole process a lot more efficiently because they automated it. They said, okay, we, we're going to automate the data collection and the analysis tasks. And we thought, okay, this sounds great. We can use this method. But then, um, but then we found three downsides, not just one. <laughs> the first downside is, of course, in order to make the model as accurate as we want, we need to put a lot of sensors now. NASA has infinite budget. The Navy doesn't have infinite budget. It's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, second, the second part is most sensors, I know you, you probably all know sensors, and most sensors that are accurate and they're good, um, they, they uh, have a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi technology within them. And the third problem was the same problem from before. Even if everything is automated, the data collection is automated, the analysis tasks are automated, we still need, when, the warning, when there's warnings, we still need a mechanical engineer in the control room saying what it is. So we need a mechanical engineer every step of the way, from the beginning, in the middle, and all the way until the end. And then we said, okay, we don't have mechanical engineers just lying around waiting for us to, to give them tasks. I'm a computer engineer. My partner was a, an electrical engineer. What are we going to do? I said, OK, let's go find machine learning solutions. I don't know. And then we looked at the data science model. Now, the data science model, as you probably all know, it's a model that's based on the data. We only need mechanical engineers at the beginning. We need mechanical engineers to tell us how to look at the data and how to process the data and how to skip, uh, skip uh, stuff we don't want to hear and how to make the model as accurate as we want. But then, after we have an accurate model, we can actually continue by on our own. We don't need mechanical engineers holding our hands all along. At this point, you might ask yourselves, this is what happened to me. You had a working model. You had people who, who perform their jobs. They're doing predictive maintenance as, as a profession. Why go and push ML? Why look at new, new models? Why, why enter a world that's already, nobody has entered it before, in the, in the Navy at least? And the answer to that is quite simple. Um, 
I'm not a mechanical engineer and I really wanted to do this project. <laughs> but the second thing is, um, if, we look at, if we look at classic algorithms, uh, for example, um, face recognition, uh, if, we, if we were to do a rule-based algorithm on face recognition, we would fail completely because there are too many rules. There are just too many rules for me, and that's why I moved from rule-based algorithm to data science algorithms. What happens in vessels is maybe in the past there were like, I don't know, three systems on a vessel and everything was really simple and nice. Today there are hundreds of vessels and all the sounds, they, get, they interfere with one another and there's just too much noise and we can't just do a set of rules that is good and, and finds all the, all the problems and has all the solutions. That's why we decide to move the responsibility for building the set of rules to the data. So we began looking at the supervised learning. We said, okay, supervised learning is easy. We'll map an input to an output based on example input output pairs. If we look at the former example, it's faces to names. If we look at our project, it's engine sounds to working, not working. We had to start somewhere. We couldn't start from a huge vessel with a lot of engines talking to each other. We had to, to start from just one engine. But then we said, what if a foreign fleet, for example, has a hundred types of vessels? Vessel A, vessel B, vessel C. And every type of vessel has like, I don't know, 40, 40 ships, each type. And each type of vessel has 50 engines inside of it, and they're all different from one another, and they're all different between the vessels themselves. It's too much information to tag. I don't have the manpower. I didn't have the manpower a year ago, and I don't have the manpower right now. And what if, what if uh, I need to change some, somewhere in the next couple of months? I, f I will finish tagging, and then I, will, I have a new engine entering the database. I have to tag it a few months from now. I, I need to have a manpower in a, few, in a few months from now. That's something I couldn't, I couldn't agree with. It's something that I couldn't do with my project. And so we moved on to the unsupervised method. And then we said, okay, unsupervised method. We don't need to sit and tag for a year now. We can just find patterns from a data set without reference to known or labeled outcomes. And we found that two methods in the unsupervised, in the unsupervised, method, in the unsupervised approach uh, fit our problems. The first one was clustering. Clustering allows you automatically to split the data set into groups. And this could solve us the problem of, for example, if we have a sensor and the sensor collects data from three engines that are lined up against each other, because we don't have sensors on each and every one of the mechanical pieces in, in the vessel, of course. Clustering can help us define which, which, um, which of the information the sensor collects belongs to which of the engines. So that's the first part that unsupervised helped us solve. And the second part was the anomaly detection. Once we had three different groups of three different engines, we could take one of the groups, one of the engines, and try to find anomalies. For example, if engine A makes the sound A all the time, whenever there was a B or a C or a D, the, the system was supposed to find it, to find this anomaly. And this is something that fits our project. Now, our project is not the first nor last project that's going to use data science for predictive maintenance. And for those of you who work in the car industry, you probably know that the car industry is way ahead of every other industry in the world. And every R&D center that respects itself has a division that deals only with predictive maintenance via data science. And NASA, of course, they're big experts. And, and but but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be just cars or just ships or just space shuttles. It can be anything. For example, for example, uh, one of my friends um, in her company they try to map out uh, map, map out all the hard drives and test their liability. And they didn't call it predictive maintenance, I don't think. But but they actually did it. They collected data and then they tested their hard drives and now they know the state of each and every one of their hard drives. And whoever of you who wants to try and test some data themselves, and there's a really good link I can share with you um, that has about 15 data sets of uh, different types of engines of space shuttles, and that's really nice that NASA gives it to us for free. Um, now, imagine a world where you enter your car and you can actually see the mechanic state of each and every one of the mechanical pieces within the car. That's amazing, right? 
but it's not the future, it's the present, and in some places it's already the past. And the same as it is for the car industry and the same as it is for NASA, I want the same for my ship. And that's why I'm pursuing this, this project. Now, data science, as you all know, is, is very good. <laughs> and we need to use data science for, uh, we need to use data, data science for a, a big range of projects, not just personalization of products or personalization of, of events on Facebook and stuff like that. There's a really big range of stuff we can do. And it's really interesting, even if it's, just, if it's old machines or stuff like that. So we know that data science is the bridge between the old world of machines and the new world of machines that learn. And this is where I invite you all to do predictive maintenance with me. Thank you. So did you combine the, the features from all the three domains uh, in your de data science project? Which domains? Uh, the acoustic, the vibration. No, we used only acoustic. Um, because this is what fits our project, but when, if we see that the model is not accurate enough, we could move to vibration. This is something we're considering. Yes. When you're dealing with the Israeli Navy and you deal with the engines that belong to a military boat, you need to know if the engine will work. When we speak about maintenance, what it means maintenance from your perspective? Because if you decide example from your result that the engine will not work and then somebody have to change it and that's critical and you have to do it in the right time. The big promise the big promise of predictive maintenance is it's not that we stop doing preventive maintenance or we stop doing breakdown maintenance. Is predictive maintenance we can stop doing breakdown maintenance because we can predict the fault before it happens. But also, because we know the exact state of the engine, we know how to schedule correctly the preventive maintenance. Not every three months or every 20,000 K or <laughs> just a number that comes out of a head. It's, it's made by the state, the actual state of each and every one of the engines. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, it's not either or, it's everything together, just more efficient. The quality of the sound, when you uh, get a sound, you yes. have a different configuration of the format of audio that you get. Yes. Did you try different... Uh... No, we only tried one format. But it's good enough for us. It's something that, that I agree that maybe in the pa maybe in the present, maybe in the future we'll try other formats, but this one works for us uh, for the meantime. But it's a good thing to think about. <laughs> Thank you. If anybody has further questions.